So we've been talking a little bit about evangelism. And evangelism is the sharing of the good news. The good news of the gospel. Sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ to other people. Now there's a television show that I've been watching recently. I guess it's a streaming show that I watch on my television. And it comes out 9 o'clock our time, 12 o'clock New York time, so other people have to wait till Friday. I get to see it on Thursday, and I tell people about it. And it's finally getting good. It's been building, and there's been backstories and characters. I've had to slog through some of it, but I saw where it was going, and it's just starting to pick up. I have different people that I talk about this with, and some of them talk to me, and I need to make sure I watch it before, because they have no problem spoiling it for me. And so, it is not unnatural for us as humans to share good news. It is not unnatural for us to tell people what excites us. Now, frankly, some of you enjoy certain sports teams. Some of you like the Dodgers. Others of you like the Rams. Some of us like the Vikings. And we have those Packer fans out there. <laughs> but nonetheless, when our teams are doing well, we share. When our teams are doing poorly, we take our lumps. True fans stick with their teams in highs and lows. And we sometimes take the, the jazz, and the, the razzing and the jabs that people give to us, all because we know that's our team. And when they do good, we let people know. Children participate in sports, in art, in school. And, and I always find it humorous that there's little bumper stickers. My child was an honor student at whatever, whatever. And the parents are prideful of this, so they put it on their car. But then there are other parents who have the dummies of the world. And they have the bumper stickers that say, my child can beat up your honor students. You don't take pride that my kid's got a brain, but he's got brawn. And you know what? There are people in the world who are not college bound. They are ditch diggers, and we need ditch diggers. There are people in the world who are not going to make it in a trade school, but they're going to be able to flip burgers. There are people who have got their doctorate, have fallen on hard times, and they are asking, do you want fries with that? In fact, when we were looking at essential workers, back when things were shut down for a while, one of the essential workers was people at a fast food store. People who delivered food to those who stayed inside and didn't want to venture out into the world. So there are people who are essential. Now other people got into nursing, other people got into uh, care for the elderly, other people took things in relation to fire departments, police. There are various people who are essential. Some would even value or venture to say that ministers were essential. And I would go out and see different people. Now, this isn't to say that any of you are not essential. Some of you are very essential. You were just happened to do your work in your homes. Some of us just got the short end of the stick, and we, well, how, what do we do? And, and I bring all of these things up because here in humanity, here we have an opportunity that we can reach out to other people. That we can do things with other people. We are resilient and we find ways to get through tough times. And all of this is usually a result of communication. If we can effectively communicate, good things happen. Uh, there is not, okay, so if, if, you're, if you're not really sure, I'm going to clarify right now. There is not. But if you heard me say, fire, there are two thoughts you're thinking of. Is there some sort of a uh, assembly line with men and, uh, men and women with rifles and they're ready to uh, shoot someone down? So do I duck? Or are there flames around the building? 
clear communication. All right, everyone, orderly, stand up. We're going to go out the back doors. There's a fire in the building. Let us just pick up your things and leave. Please do not run. Please calm yourselves and let us exit. Clear communication. No one says anything. The fire starts coming through. Heidi's back there. He watches the fire kind of starting burning in the back. And somebody in the back says, there's no smoke. But, nah, not worried about it. Take a peek. You look back around. Uh, I, I saw a comic a little while ago where it was saying how women should be silent in the church. And then it showed a fire breaking out. And the women were seeing it and pointing to it, but they couldn't say anything. And the church burned down because women were to be silent in the church. Now, I think there is some context that we have to understand here. And then if we read through the scriptures, we can find that clear communication is exactly what Jesus promoted as he talked about evangelism. Some communication was through our hands. Some was through our mouth. Some was through our ears. Did you know you communicate through your ears? Just because people are talking does not mean communication happens. Somebody has to listen. And then somebody has to respond. I think there's a movie, and Erica could tell me which one it is, but there's something about a failure to communicate. Major pain, man. That's, that's what I thought. Was. So we have a failure to communicate. And, and in relation to this, sometimes evangelism is a failure to communicate. Now, we talked about a variety of approaches. One of them was the direct approach. And this was confrontational. Where you go up to somebody and you tell them, this is the good news, and I'm going to tell you about it. And by the end of it, you ask them a question. Something like, if you were to die today, do you know 100% that you would be in heaven? And some of us are not comfortable going up to other people to confront them. Okay? So others are. There are lots of people who are, so don't worry about if that is not your cup of tea. We also talked a lot, uh, I believe last week, we talked about the testimonial approach. So someone has done something or said something to your life, and you are able to speak up and say, look what has been done to me. Last week we talked about the man who was blind, and Jesus spit on the floor and made mud. And then he took the mud and he put it on the man's eyes and the man was able to see. And he told people about this. His testimony. He shared this. Now we have another one in which we'll look at today and that is the intellectual approach. Um, in this evangelism, Paul is a very good model of this. Uh, Paul in Acts chapter 17 he reasoned with the philosophers, and the deep thinkers of Athens. And today it is practiced by apologists. Not because they are apologizing. Please don't get me wrong there. Uh, but they are people who have a testimony, but they also have prepared proofs for their salvation, for their faith, for the gospel. And they also speak to other logical thinkers. Perhaps you are a person who likes ideas, evidence, logical thinking. Christian apologists, you might be the intellectual evangelist. See people like Josh McDowell, James Kennedy, William Craig. Even some, and, and keep in mind, there are some great people who have done some great things and they have had some bad failures in life. One of the great apologists was a man named Ravi Zacharias. But we've seen in recent years some things have come out as far as some indiscretions in which he was a part of, both financially and morally. Uh, many of the approaches of evangelism that I, I look at uh, came from a, a man named Bill Hybels, and he was a man who created a, a great church out of something that was so-so, and he books and tours and speaking and all these things, and 
he had some problems in the end of his ministry that led to, a, we'll say, a fall from grace. And so then the question comes down to, if somebody says something poorly, does something wrong, does it negate their entire ministry? Now, some would say yes. And that's why Jesus had to be sinless. Because if Jesus had sinned, the people who want to nitpick on things will have gone through everything and said, well, what about this, and what about this, and what about this? Throw it out. There are people, politicians, who have said good things. But some of their records on what they have voted on, mm. there are presidents in the world, in the United States, who have done great things. But just because of the party in which they were associated with, they could never be taken seriously. There are people who have said great things. There are people who have done great things. But because of a couple of indiscretions in their life, some people want to throw that all out the window. So we need to be mindful. We do not put people on a pedestal because people will let you down. Um... People, 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 people. Is there anyone here who has ever been let down by another person? A couple of you nodding, yes. Okay. A couple of you nodding off. <laughs> uh, we have all been let down by someone. And for those of you who have not yet been let down, let, let down or left down, it's coming, or you yourself have done so to someone else. Most of us like to look at the things that other people have let us down in and forget the fact that, you know what, we've had our own shortcomings at times as well. Anybody ever forget something? I mean, I forget my keys, I forget my wallet, I forgot my kid one. Well, left her in the car and she... He locked the door. She was not even two. Still one, right? Not one and only and one. She, she was locked in the car. And I didn't have my keys because they were in the car. And there were all of these, God, what do I do? And the number one thing, I tried to keep calm. And my daughter was, and she was excited to be in the car, and she played around and did her thing. And then she decided to crawl up to the front seat. I'm like, oh, Jesus, help me out here. Just push the unlock button. Just push the unlock button. So I'm doing everything I can to draw her attention to the unlock button. She's pushing the window buttons. Nothing's happening. Again, the car's off. The windows are up. The sheriff is there. He's about to bust the window open on her. I'm like, oh, you're going to traumatize her for life. She's going to be afraid of the police because there's going to be a big stick. Glass is going to fly everywhere. And she's inching over to the other button. She inches to the other button. And for a second, she hits the unlock button. And my hand is right there. And I, um, I pull that door, and then she hits the unlock, or the lock button. But I had already opened it. And so even though she locked that door, I opened it, and I pulled her out. The sheriff cheered, and the other people that had gathered. We had a little mini party. And then we got up and we went across the street to the event we were supposed to be at in the first place. It was an amazing experience. But I forgot my key inside the car as I was changing my daughter's diapers. I, I, I messed up. I goofed. And all of us have had this moment in which we have let someone else down just by a simple lapse in our memory. And so some of us having this lapse in this memory, maybe we're not the intellectual approach. I mean, you have to be someone with gumption to have the direct approach. You have to have someone with a history or a story to give the testimonial approach. And you have to have someone who's well-to-do put together mentally to have the intellectual approach. Now, there are people who were my theological professors who will have forgotten more in their life than I will ever learn in my life. They have read hundreds of thousands of books. 
I mean, I, I know I had some professors who was their goal to read three books a day. That's 900 plus books or a thousand books a year. And when they read those kid books for <coughs> lots of books, and, and you wonder how some people can get through some things, an article and just going through. And then what did you read? They can tell you. And then 20 years later, I think I read something somewhere. It's amazing what some people's minds can unlock. So this, this is kind of the dividing point, I mean, as, as we see what, what some people can do. But there's this other one, and I'd like to encourage us to look at this. And this is what's called the interpersonal relationship. Is that the one we've got there? Oh, excuse me, the invitational, sorry, invitational approach. And this is where you go, and you say, I don't know what to tell you. But I've got something going on on Sunday, and I'm wondering if you'd come with me. I don't have any good pitch. Now, some people have a good sales pitch, and, and they're really good. But the invitational approach is, is, is similar to what I'll talk about next week, the interpersonal. But it's, as its name suggests, you invite people. Now, my niece Taylor was a very good invitation giver. She played on a little softball team, and she asked this friend to come, and then she asked this friend to come. And, hey, I've got church on Thursday night. Come on over. I've got this. Come on over. People went over to the house and swam, but just as much people came to church because she had no fear of inviting someone and they telling her no. Because she was also very friendly, and so she said, hey, come with me. And it's amazing to see a lot of people go places because they are asked. Uh, last weekend, our Spanish church asked me to come watch a performance that they did. I don't normally attend their services, but they invited me, and I said, okay, and I came. If you have a dinner at your house and you invite someone, there's a possibility that they will Oh, because it's free food, right? Now, maybe they've had your cooking before, and they know that dinner actually means pizza. Okay. Maybe they've never had your cooking before, and they want to experiment. And maybe they've had your cooking before, and it's just not going to happen. So they're going to decline. Okay. There are people you can invite that will respectfully decline. If you've ever sent out wedding invitations, the general rule of thumb is the amount of envelopes you send out is about the amount of people that will show up. So if you send 100 envelopes out, you know if you send one to me, you'll probably have Mr. and Mrs. Harbison. You may even have Mr. and Mrs. Harbison and family. You might include Reverend, I don't know. But all of a sudden, one envelope has two or three invites in it. Okay. But like I said, the rule of thumb is that every envelope represents a person because there are going to be people that don't show up. You send them a letter and they live in Kansas City and there's no way they're going to get there? Okay, well at least I told you about it. A lot of us are used to inviting. Maybe it's just to dinner. Maybe we invite our family members to get into the car because we're leaving and without them, they're not going to have a ride. Maybe we have invited people kind of insistently, perhaps. But there is a thriving on people to events like a church service. Come and see. Perhaps a retreat, a Bible study. This is one of the most natural ways new believers are able to reach out to others. If you may not have the right words to say, get them to come over. In John chapter 4, verse 29, we have a key phrase here. And I'm going to give you some background before I read the verse. Some of you have memorized John chapter 4. You know it quite well. Jesus 
has just finished talking to Nicodemus, and we hear John 3, 16, and we have all these spiritual truths. And now he's another day, and Jesus, like any other person, gets a little thirsty. So what does he do? He goes by, and he sits by a well. And he tells his disciples, go into town and get something to eat, drink, do something. Meanwhile, he is going to wait at this well. A woman comes by, and he asks her for something to drink. And she kind of balks a little bit, and he tells her something to the nature of, hey, I can give you everlasting water, water that does not run dry, where you will not go thirsty anymore. And this lady's first thought was, oh, Indoor plumbing would be so nice. Imagine, how many of you have lived in a time or a place or a cabin or whatever where there was no indoor plumbing? That's a big couple of hands. There's been some places. Not only is the outhouse in the back, but there's a pump. You don't get to go into the kitchen, turn on a little spigot, and the water comes out. Imagine living life without a shower inside the bathroom, inside the house. Oh, barbarians. But this was a reality, and this woman said, Oh, I would love to have this water. Because now I wouldn't have to come to this pump and this well, and I won't have to get this anymore. Please give it to me. How can I get it? And Jesus asked her about, Well, you know, there's, I'm the one who will be able to supply this to you. And he gives her this discussion, and he talks to her about you Samaritans, because that's what she was, and where you believe to, you can worship. It has to be in Jerusalem or on this mountain. They got into this dialogue, and Jesus makes a statement. He says, there's a day coming, and it is here, that you will no longer need to go to the temple or to the mountain to worship, for God desires people who worship in spirit and in truth. And the location does not matter. And Jesus talks to this woman and it is revealed through Jesus that he tells her that she needs to go and get her husband. And she says, I have no husband. And he says, that's correct. Because the man you're with is not your husband and you've had three other men before him. Not really sure if she was a gold digger? Not really sure if she was a black widow and they just happened to pass? Uh, I'm not really sure what happened, but this woman was, she got her out. And Jesus told her to go. And she says clearly in verse 29 when she goes to the village, she says, come and see a man who told me whatever that I have done. Can this be the Christ? We also have other people who are inviters. Andrew, the brother of Peter. Peter, this great disciple. Peter was nothing if Andrew had not said, come. Come. Andrew was the great bringer. He found the boy with the lunch and he was able to get the five loaves and the two fish and said, come, let's bring this to Jesus. Andrew was a man who found ways to get people to come. You, as a person, can share the good news and do something as simple as come. Maybe on Halloween, you can tell someone, hey, I'm going to pass candy out to the kids in the community. Come and sit with me as I go to my church's booth and pass out candy. Just come. Okay. Maybe you need to go and drive to pick the kids up from camp, and you need a carpool, and you say, come. There are times in our lives where a simple invitation, come play on our church's softball team. Come. Okay. These are the things that can draw people in. These are the things that can get people to be part of the Christian community. 
These are the things that advances the kingdom of God. The simple word, come. Now Jesus said that many times as well as he was walking with his disciples. He went up to Matthew, the tax collector, and he said, what word, what word did I just use it? What word did he say? Come. Come. Never done that. Come and follow me. Jesus was a great inviter. Not only did Jesus share the good news with a variety of methods, but one of his methods was come and see. Follow me. Imagine if you had a person in your life who said, come, follow me. Perhaps you came to a church because someone said, come, follow me. Maybe your parents said, come with me or else. Maybe your parents didn't even say come. Maybe your parents said go. You're going to church. I'm going to stay home. But you're going to go. Maybe, maybe that was your history. But one reason or another, those of you who are sitting with us today in the pews, and those of you who are sitting at home watching on your screen, someone, somewhere, invited you. Maybe it was just the YouTube thing that was the next on the reel. Oh, see what's next. Oh, look at this. I'll come. And I encourage each of you to find your method because one size does not fit all. And each of these methods some of you are identifying with or rejecting completely. And we'll be looking in the next couple of weeks what other methodologies and opportunities are. But yes, one size does not fit all. And I'm not expecting any of you to go out and knock on someone's door and say, come with me. But I am saying, you know the good news of Jesus Christ. You have been sought. You have been saved. You were lost. You were found. And if that isn't good enough, then look at the blessings in which God has bestowed on your life and share them with one another. And we see that we need, in order to figure out how to do this, we need to work together. This community, this church here, is not full of people who say, come. This church has people who can do this and talk to people intellectually. And this church has people who can say, come. And they are also, this church has people who can go ahead and talk with a testimony because they are saved out of something. And amen, hallelujah, glory be. Because together we are stronger. Together we are better. And the kingdom of God grows because we, as a community of faith, tell others the good news. Amen. Dear Jesus, we come before you today again and we thank you for our time. We thank you for our peace. We thank you for the things in which you have given us. Lord, there is conflict around the world and testimonies are developing. We ask that a conflict does not start in our life so that we have this testimony to share. But may we be bold, may we be brave, may we tell people, come. Lord, as we are out this week and about, as we sit around and we go somewhere perhaps to eat, and we see someone sitting alone, Lord, if you prompt us through the Spirit, may we go to them and say, hey, come over and sit at our table. God, may we create relationships with people. May we be intentional. May we be invitational. And may our focus be on sharing the good news. Lord, if the four options that have been shared so far has not resonated with us, O oh Lord, may we be faithful in looking to see how your good news can be shared with others through our life and our methodology of sharing. Comfort us, encourage us, and guide us, O oh Lord. We ask all of these things in your name. Amen. Amen.